Hey, family. Good to see you. Uh, really good to be here. If you've got your Bibles, if you could go to Genesis chapter 1. Um, really uh, excited about the opportunity to continue our Built Different series. Um, I want to title this Identity in the Image. Identity in the Image. Um, I want to give you a vision for how God wants you to relate and reflect the creator. Um, I think we live in a day and age where we're burdened with identity. And I want to work to try to remove the burden that all of us feel. I want to do that by helping you discover uh, and form and execute the the purposes that God has for you, because for most of us, we feel the burden to identify and execute the purposes of our own life. The pressure's on us. And I, I really have a, a sense that what we're going to discover uh, about this idea of identity and finding identity in the image of the creator, the one that formed us, that knows us, that has a purpose for us, that that purpose is way bigger than what we think. And that we are built different because we have a built-in identity that we're made to discover. It's built into us. The question is, how do we go about doing that? What does it look like for us as a people to simply both identify in regards to the identity of, this, of the image that we've been made to, to now relate and reflect? Let's, let's look at the, at, the, at the scriptures in Genesis chapter 1. If you want to stand with me as, as, as we read, we're going to read in verses 24 down uh, to 27, and then we'll, we'll skip to 31. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures according to their kinds, livestock and creeping things and beasts of the earth according to their kinds. And it was so. God made the beasts of the earth according to their kinds and the livestock according to their kinds and everything that creeps on the ground according to its kind. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heaven and over the livestock and over the, the earth and over Every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. And in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. Verse 31. God saw everything that he had made. and Behold, it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning the sixth day. Lord, form us in your, in, the, in this beautiful a text in regards to the image of God. Allow for our hearts to come alive. Lord, will you, we give you the permission to place your hands on our hearts. Quicken the identity that you have for us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. It's corn. A big lump with knobs. It has the juice. Now, that is quite the introduction after that text. About a year ago, uh, our friend Tariq entered into the world as corn, not, not corn boy, corn king. The corn, the corn king uh, stepped into um, the, the wonderful world of songs that get played and replayed and replayed again. And if your family was like ours, uh, we, we heard this thing constantly. And this is, what it, this is how, how the song goes. It's corn. Big lump with knobs. It has the juice. It has the juice. I can't imagine a more beautiful thing. It's corn, people. I can tell you all about it. I mean, look at this thing. When I tried it with butter, everything changed. Now, now the, I think the reason that we love this so much is because you have one young man who's ascribing greatness to something that is insignificant. Something that's 
dismissed, he gives us a vision that now incites a desire to want it. The culture that we live in, it's a cultural narrative that is describing insignificance to the human purpose. We live in a world of the sovereignty of self. You do what you want. Humans have been given the freedom to, to now break away. It's an invitation to break away from the previous generation, break away from re religious authority, break away from political authority, break away from the larger society as a whole. Anything outside the self, you are invited, break away. St. Augustine, what he does is he defines this idea of sin. Sin is love turned inward. And what we are living in is in a world where we are the creator and we create a world and we saddle ourselves with that responsibility and, and in so doing, life becomes insignificant. We want it to be significant, but because we are in control and the overwhelming sense of pressure and tension, we're, we're longing for something to awaken us to now this a vision of what we are truly made for, a true identity that is bigger than ourself. We're longing for it. We live in an age of Narcissus. The Greek mythology has become our reality. If you don't know anything about the story of Narcissus, he was a beautiful young man who had everything you could possibly imagine except one day he discovered an image of himself. And he disconnected himself from everything around him and all he did was he, he fed on the image of him and he forgot to eat. And the very thing that he was ingratiated with himself it ends up being the very thing that kills him. We are living in a day and age where identity is rooted in the image, in the image of ourself. And the human story of purpose and value and worth has become an insignificant one. And yet, what I, I'm hoping, I'm truly hoping, that what we will look at and consider is that God, through Genesis 1, what he's doing is he's creating a vision for us of what identity and life in himself, what it looks like to now awaken, to now breathe afresh on what does it look like? What does it truly mean for me to relate to and reflect that image? What does it look like for me to now hold up my, the, the hands of my own identity and give God the permission to breathe on it? And, and consider what, what might you have for me, for, for my world, for my life, for, for who we are as a people to actually be built, built different in regards to our culture, it's going to require a different identity. I love what Psalms 8, 3 says about trying to create now a, um, a, a significance in regards to who we are and how we've been made. This is what it says. When I look at your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have set in place... What is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you care for him? Yet you have made him a little lower than the heavenly beings and crowned him with glory and honor. We've been crowned with something. You have given him dominion for the works of your hand. The story of Genesis 1-1 is a foreign story in comparison to creation narratives of that day. We have narratives such as the Song of Kumarbi, which is the myth of the Hittites, or Enuma Elish, which is the myth of the Babylonian creation tale. And all of these tales, what they have, to, it's very common that, that the new can only be created through subduing or conquering of another. Ancient stories that are filled with blood and, and gore, Worlds that are created as a result of one dying and another living. A god or a goddess has to die in order for the universe to come into being. And yet, in Genesis 1, there's no rival. No one for God to be in conf conflict with. No antagonist. In this grand creation plan, stealing away the sun, there's no one there. 
In contrast, it is remarkably calm and ordered. What we can conclude is that God has a plan and there is no opposition. The bedrock of the Trinity is that it is established out of a self-giving love and from that, establish a universe created out of that very essence. Love, harmony, peace, not war, discord, and violence. I love what Emil Bruner says. He says, love does not seek value, but it creates value or gives value. It does not desire to get, but to give. It is not attracted by some lovable quality, but it is poured out on those who are worthless and degraded. This is the backdrop of the Trinity creating, creating out of self-giving love. And what you have in the creation account is a tight staccato. It's a rhythm of God speaking and something appearing. Explosion of creativity. You've got perfection on display. Fruit trees, heavens, stars, night, birds, creatures, livestock. Yet in verse 26, the tone and rhythm abruptly change. Instead of God speaking and something being created, God announces what he is going to make before he makes it. Let us make man in our image, as if there is, this, is the, this is the prime moment. This is what everything is leading towards. Consider the timing and formation of everything God made. It was as if he had a method whereby he was preparing a space in which everything you could possibly imagine was in place for his crown jewel. Mankind, to not just survive, but to thrive. Everything is being formed to now take the crown jewel, us, in his image, place us. The backdrop is that we are created out of love, by love, for love. This creator God uses his power and his authority to place his image in mankind, resulting in humanity being altogether unique and distinct from the rest of creation. But we have a problem. We have to consider the question, what does it mean to be made in the image of God because we are not told? Now, here's, here's the thing to remember. This is written to an ancient Near East audience, and when they would have heard the term made in the image of God, they would have quickly and instinctively understood exactly what that meant. The image of God was kingly, royal language. Only the king or the pharaoh or the ruler of that region reflected the image of God uh, and every other human existed as a subservient to serve that God or that king or Pharaoh. Their value and worth were nothing compared to that king, the son of God, the image of God. They existed for the good of that ruler. In fact, being made in the image meant a son that God uh, son of God that held special power. That this, this son of God, this image of God would create laws, form culture, establish a rule of life because they were doing it in the authority of that God. He actually ruled as God for God. It was very common for a statue representing that God to be placed in the center of the city or in the center of that temple. And the temple uh, being the place where that God, where God and, and men met. And with that statue, the spirit of that God now resided with the people. So when God creates a garden, 
and places man in that garden and declares, let us make man in our image, he is actually doing the following. God is declaring that every person created uh, and designed, uh, it is, is actually created and designed in his image and thus is making all mankind royal. Made to be royal. Created to interact with a God as royal. This is a value and dignity to every human regardless of productivity, capacity, ethnicity, and viability. No matter how many are created in this image, in God's image, that image is not diluted. I mean, just, I, I don't know if you, if you got a chance to collect baseball cards as a kid. I, I'm an 80s, 90s kid, which meant that most of us create, or we, we worked hard to have a, like, 10 or 12 books filled with baseball cards. And in college, I actually thought, man, those cards are going to, like, pay for cars and get me houses. I mean, those cards are going to be worth something. What I didn't realize is that if you know anything about baseball cards in the 80s and 90s, that's known as the junk era. And the reason is because they created too many cards. In overpopulation, the value was lost. Only God can create and have 8 billion people in the earth. And the image of every single one of them remains distinct, perfect, and now, now instinctively ready to be awakened because God's stamp is on them. Stamp is on them. That this is, this is the beauty and transcendence. This is the power and potency of the creator. God is declaring that every human being has an innate design to relate to God as a son or daughter. I love what Blaise Pascal says. He's a famous mathematician. He says, there is a God-shaped vacuum in the heart of each man which cannot be satisfied by any created thing, but only by God the creator made known through Jesus Christ. That inside of every single person is a longing and a desire and a, and a passion to interact with and to connect with the transcendent. I love what one theologian said, every time a man goes to a brothel, he's looking for God. We are looking to connect with the one that stamped himself on us everywhere. We're searching, we're longing, yet we're built. Those who are awakened by the message of Jesus were built different because now we are interacting, finding our identity in the image. Consider this, we are never meant to self-create our identity, but receive that identity from a God that has only love, and commitment and faithfulness to operate out of. And within this secure identity, he creates us to have unending relationship, interac interaction, and closeness with himself. God is declaring that mankind was created to now not just relate to him, but ultimately to reflect him. To reflect this creator and the way we rule creation, the very place in which he made us. See, other gods needed an image or, or statue to represent them. God's statue was you. Do you realize that? The Garden of Eden, a temple, the place where God and man met, and at the center of that temple, mankind. The very mankind that now God's presence was God promised to interact and give himself fully to, to him. Do you realize that there was no, God didn't live in heaven, that there was no distance between heaven and earth? God came down and now was existing. His whole purpose was to be with that which he created. This, this, I'm trying to give you a vision. If corn kid, corn king 
can give us a vision for corn, might we consider the God of all creation helping you awaken to the fact that you have an identity that he gave you and that he wants to breathe on? The garden is the temple. Humanity is at the center. Living, breathing, abiding in regards to that image that will reign with love, harmony, and peace. God is dwelling with man in the temple, the garden. As soon as we just begin to sink our teeth into what it looks like to relate to God, and to reflect God, mankind decides that they want to dispose of what they've had. The love that we were made for and from is now turned in on itself. The self-giving love that created us is twisted into self-taking love. The posture of receiving and resting in their identity given by God pivots to restlessness. They weren't satisfied with what they were given and wanted it and they wanted to have it their own way. I love what Jeff Cook says about this idea of, of what drove Adam and Eve to dis dismantling and dismissing the identity they were given. Pride spurs me to view myself as the only one in the entire world who matters. To think that I have somehow earned the prime spot in the universe, and now all of creation is a grand symphony celebrating me. Pride is not thinking too much of myself. Pride is thinking of myself far too much. And as scandalous as this creation narrative is, God's response to the human rebellion of sin has to be even more scandalous. Logic would cause us to assume that this rebellion would destroy the image of God given to mankind. And yet what we find in Genesis Chapter 9, verse 6, is we find a different approach. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed. For God made man in his own image. He's still sticking to this. Do you see that? This is Genesis 9. This is after the fall. You would think that, that now God is going to churn. He's going to, to, to go a different route in regards to his image being in mankind, the very mankind that rebelled on him. And yet what we find in God is that sin didn't erase the image of God, but permanently defaced it. There's still hope. There's still hope. But the image and the identity has been defaced. We are unable to reflect and relate to this God. Fulfilling the purpose that we were created for, we can't do it. A rulership of the earth has collapsed from an outward focus established in love, peace, and harmony to control, hatred, and dehumanizing tor torment. I love the um, picture behind me. This is the Millennium Tower. If you know anything about San Francisco... San Francisco is built on a landfill. Every building there is built on trash. And yet, every builder there knows one thing. You have to go down deep to build your foundation. And yet, the builder of this building, they, they refuse to invest the resources needed to go down into the foundation. And the result is that this building is sinking and tilting. Sinking and tilting. One inch every year. To the point that the builders are investing $10 billion to try to fix the foundation. The more they try, the worse it gets. When you think about the identity that we have as a culture built on self, it is an identity built on a landfill. It is sinking and tilting, sinking and tilting. Yet the question has to be asked, who will make us our image? Who will restore us? Who will restore our purpose? Who will renew our humanity? I love what Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 says, that he is the image. Now remember, we're talking about identity in the image. What does it look like? How far is God willing to go to build you and I different? 
He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together that we we have a hope of one man who came to now relate to God and reflect God's image in the perfect way. He's the only one that could do it. And he's willing to extend his whole life, exhausting himself, allowing himself to be humiliated and tormented. He is allowing himself to do that because he wants you to have the identity that you were created to have. He's he's exhausting himself so that you and I could be built different with an identity in the image. What do you have in Jesus? He has one who relates to the Father. Remember, mankind was made to relate and reflect. Relate and reflect. Jesus comes and he relates to the Father. How? When he's baptized, this is my son whom I love. With him I'm well pleased. He had a relationship with the Father that was built on acceptance and affirmation. Do you realize that because of who Jesus is and what he's done, he has been a forerunner for you to now allow for you to have the very words that the son had of you are my dear son and daughter. For you, I love and I'm well pleased. The very baptism of affirmation and acceptance that defines Jesus defines us. This is the identity that he had that now he relates to the father in a way, it's a, it's a self, it's the father is giving himself fully to the son, and the son, long before he does anything, is described as affirmed, accepted, and approved. He reflects the image of the father, perfect image. He does it by having self-giving love. You see it all throughout his ministry. He goes to a woman at the well. What does he do? gives her her image back, reflects himself to her, and as a result, she comes alive with her identity. Woman caught in adultery. Just the, 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 the desperation of, of shame and guilt on her face, and you have in Jesus one approaching her, and what does he do? He relates the, the, the image of the king through himself to her, by restoring, seeing what's broken, and taking a step to bring wholeness in life. He relates, reflects. And what we have, you might be asking, well, Corey, how does that identity become mine? We're told that in 2 Corinthians 4.4, that it is the gospel of the glory of Jesus, who is the image of God, that restores the image. This is what it says. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel, of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, that the gospel is the actual image of God himself that now awakens us, opens our heart. Now it, it gives us an introduction of who we are, but who we're made to be. It's the gospel. It's that, that's why we are a gospel people is because this is the only thing that we have to allow for people to come into their identity. To be introduced to who they were truly meant to be. Now all of life is now an ongoing process of being formed into the image of the firstborn son. This is Romans chapter 8. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed, formed, formed to the image of the Son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So now the the questions, the processes of a Christian heart change from, is that sin? Or am I allowed to dot, 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 question now is, how is this forming me? Who is this thing forming me into? Now, now the questions aren't, 
Can I smoke marijuana when it's legal in Virginia and it's Bible doesn't talk about it? Can I? Man, that's the wrong question. You know that. Like, we know that. Like, the question of, man, can I, how far can I go in a dating relationship? Man, that's the wrong question. And can I date that person? I, they haven't been to church in about a year and a half, but man, I'm, that, that's the, the wrong question. Like, we, we know these are the wrong questions. Like, we know. We know. The, the question is, what is this forming me into? Why? Because the image is so valuable. The, the image, you have to see, the image is priceless. What it costs the king to give you a new image. Yeah, that now you look at the image and you go, man, I want to guard the image. I want to guard it. I want to protect it. It's not about how far can I go. It's what can I do to protect the image I've been given. It, ch it, change, it has to change the way that we see ourselves, the world around us. And let, let me, I'm just going to bring you into how God is forming, is putting his vision of his image being formed into my heart. I'm, I, I'm on, my eyes are being opened, I'll be very honest. Ephesians 5.10 is at the key of where I'm at. Carefully determine what pleases the Lord. Take no part in worthless deeds of evil and darkness. Instead, expose them. Here's some questions. How is the image of Jesus actively forming my wounds? How is the image of Jesus actively forming my wounds? Most of us have a very sterile relationship with Jesus. He just doesn't really make very many entrances into the wounds of our soul. I'm trying to invite him in more for him to touch my wounds, for him to partner with me in forming himself in my wounds. Now, if you've ever been to a, a person who's cracking your back or working on certain parts of your body that haven't moved certain ways in a long time, that process of formation, it hurts. It hurts. It's so painful. Just trying to get your hip to go three inches one direction. It's like you're, I don't know what it's like to have, have a baby. I don't know. But I'm, I don't even know. But I just have had pain of my hip, like my legs being, just the pro, I know that was a terrible example. I mean, not, you're going to crush me at the end of this. I'm so sorry. But the pain of things being formed in you that are supposed to exist, it's so hard. And you sweat. And you don't want it. You want to go away. You don't want to show up the next time. I, I'm telling you, the Spirit of God cares about his image in you, he wants to put his hands on your wounds. The wounds that I wrestle with my whole life is the singular wound of I'm unlovable. So man, I can, I can be a grinder, I can perform, I can, man, I can, I, I can produce. I have to wonder, and the Spirit of God has been working in me, going, Corey, are you producing or are you trying to silence the wound where you, you wonder, are you unlovable? And so you're acting and you're, you're working and you're working so hard. You're doing so much, but why are you doing it, man? How am I actively protecting the image of God in my family? I'm sitting here preparing for this message and my wife says something and I just, I, I literally, I did this to the table. And I was so frustrated, and I, as soon as I did it, I'm like, oh my gosh. I, I'm talking about the image of God, and I'm sitting here powering up with my wife. Trying to control. Sensing the spirit of Jesus and his image. Working. Massaging. Working on that knot in my heart. How is the image of Jesus actively forming how I see races and ethnicities? I had a gentleman over the last few years come up to me and say, Corey, do you realize 
that when a Spanish man, not all, but some, go to buy a car, they pay, their interest rate is almost double as yours? Do you, do you realize how different it is for other people? And if I'm honest, it took, it's, this has been a process of God softening my heart, opening my eyes to see life through other people's context. That's hard. That is messy. So since then, I have been mentoring a young man named Jesus who came here 18 months ago, Hernan High School, a young man who's my hero, being able to hear his story of life, the challenges, the battles, to be able to just step into his world. His dad's still at home. His mom invested all that she had to bring him here. And I'm just listening, sensing God opening and softening my heart to the needs of those that are around me. Um, a good friend of mine is in Chicago, and he sent me this picture. And it's the last picture, yeah. So this is at a police station in Chicago. Venezuelan refugees being dropped off in Chicago, and apparently all of the police stations are just like this. And here he is saying, Corey, I'm walking around my city, and it's so easy to keep my head down. It's so easy to keep my head down, and I feel like God is softening my heart to look, to look through the lens of identity, of God's image, to see people through his eyes that now just might cause me to do some things that are really uncomfortable for me. How does the image of God shape how I see the issue of sex trafficking and pornography? Nancy Piercy says this, the most extreme examples of, de of depersonalized sex is pornography. The viewer disconnects the woman's body from any interest in who she is as a person. Pornography tears apart what, it, what is meant to be integrated, treating the body as an object or instrument for one's own purpose. And I know many of you are navigating with this issue, and so I want to speak with sensitivity and tenderness, but um, with truth. that God is calling you to live into the image, the firstborn son, to value and to risk walking in the light for the world that you are loving in the dark. You're, you're invited. I'm inviting you into a world of light, a world that I, I'm enjoying because I know what it's like to be in the dark. I know. I know how suffocating that is. I know the overwhelming shame. I know. We have an identity in the image. How is the image of Jesus actively forming how I see the unborn? This is not a political statement. This is, a, this is an image of God statement. Psalms 139, you knit me together in my mother's womb. There are over 2,367 abortions every day. And yet, in the womb, at eight weeks, babies can suck their thumbs, recoils from pricking, all organs are present, livers are making blood cells, kidneys are cleaning fluid, fingerprints are there, it can feel, respond to sound, heart is pumping. At 21 weeks, can survive outside the mom. The baby, the baby has its own blood type, DNA. And yet, my heart turns to a longing to pray for and ask for mercy for our nation. And yet, at the same time, 
I, my heart is bursting for women who have had abortions and are dying inside because it's a secret. And as, I mean, as grace loves, like uh, my heart is to create post-abortion Bible studies for women that are just desperate to have someone help them walk into the light and, and now be restored and now come Clean, not, not just clean, but fresh in regards to their relationship with God as it pertains to the image of God that now redeems them, forgives them, weaponizes the very thing that had caused them to be stuck. This is, this is, my, this is where my heart is beating when I consider this formation process of God forming me to open up my eyes to see the world around me. Let, let, me, let me end with this. This is, a, I, I showed this, but this is, this is the best thing I got. This is kintsugi art. Um, I love the idea of kintsugi because it's a 15th century Japanese art where shogun had a tea bowl, beautiful tea, tea bowl, handed down generations, and he broke it. He wanted to fix it. And so his, his own team of people tried to fix it, but they stapled it. And it was terrible, apparently. And, and, and so he sent it off. And it was, it was this, the art of broken pottery, where it, now taking valuable gold, putting it into the cracks of that which was broken, and now presenting it as with greater value than what it had before. The breaking, the mending, and the gold adds value to the bowl. The image of God is that which, even though we have broken our own life through sin, we have. We have mashed ourselves up into powder. And a God who, who doesn't waste a tear sees every tear, and Isaiah said he collects it in a bowl. He collects it, every tear. The very God who, who knows the stars is simultaneously so present that he now wants to take all of the broken pieces of your life and your identity, and he wants to give you, he wants to give you an identity in the image of himself, who he is. He wants to introduce you to that image every day. Every day, forming you, shaping you, molding you in the image of Jesus himself. Because we're built different. We're built different. Let's pray. What an emotion. God, I'm just so, my heart's all over the place right now. I don't, just am amazed at your grace and your love that you would have a disposition towards your humanity where you just refuse to give up. You want us to walk into the image of the firstborn son. You died to give us an image that is perfect and beautiful and pristine and that you, you breathe on it and you refresh it every day. God, we are so broken for the way that we have discarded your image in our own life and the lives of others. We have discarded it. We have disembodied people. We've used them for our own good. We've despised them for where they come from. We've despised them for where they've been. We've despised, God, we have shamed your identity, and yet you are coming here freshly to extend yourself to us to say, I want to give you, I want to breathe on you and give you my own identity fresh. I want to give you an image. I want to give you a hope. I want to give you a power to be molded and shaped and moved the image of the firstborn son. God, I thank you for those who are navigating dating relationships. I just really had a sense this week of some people here are being, they're just, they're, they're being redefined, dehumanized by the dating relationships that they're in. God, you're calling men and women into a formation process of surrendering what they see for what they don't, and yet every day crying out for your strength to revive them in this process of being single. God, I just I thank you for how you are planting our church in a space because you're, you built us different. We, we don't want to be ashamed 
of the image. God, revive us in yourself. Refresh us in our relationships with one, with one another. Oh God, continue to, to send us out on a mission where we, our eyes are open. We're missional disciples that are compelling. God, we honor you. We need you. We thank you for all that you're doing in this series, in our church. In your name I pray. Amen.